5, verse 21. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21. We're going to read one verse out of Paul's writing to the church in Ephesus. And this verse is set in the context of the marriage, the husband and the wife, the relationship that the husband is to have with the wife, the wife with the husband, as it pertains to the relationship that Christ has with the church and the church has with Christ. I'm not talking about marriage tonight, but you need to understand the context that this scripture is given in. Ephesians 5.21. If you have it, say praise the Lord. I realize some of you now just look at the screen and say praise the Lord. Submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Everybody say submitting. Submitting. Look at your neighbor and say yourself. Everybody has to submit ourselves. Not submit someone else to you, but submit yourself. Submit yourself one to another in the fear of God. I want to preach to you for a few moments tonight the strength of Submission. My title is an oxymoron. I get that. It's hard to believe that there would be strength in submission, but this is a spiritual concept. There is strength in submission. Amen. You may be seated. God bless you. Submission is yielding in honor to each other, and it is a kingdom principle, I'm going to say tonight, for every successful relationship and when I say relationship obviously what Paul is talking about here tonight are relationships in the church because he said submit yourselves one to another so in the church I'll even tell you husbands and wives that submission also has to happen in the family you might say as a husband I ain't submitting no woman yeah you will after a while you'll start putting that toilet seat back down Because it's not really, really that big of a deal. It's not worth fussing and fighting over something so stupid. And so after a while, you realize, you know what? I could kick a skunk, but it ain't worth the stink. I'm going to put this lid down. Because the peace that comes from it is so much better than the issues that arise if I don't. Right? Right? Submission. Obviously, Paul teaches submission from the standpoint of the wife to the husband. But I would say that both parties have to submit one to another in order to have a healthy marriage. In the church, in the family, and in friendships. You cannot have good friendships if it's just a one-way street where one person is always just domineering on the other person. Both friends have to give a little bit and take a little bit. When both parties in a relationship honor and respect and submit to one another, both parties are going to benefit. And having these kinds of submissive relationships is a major part of enjoying life and a major part of our enjoyment of God. Paul says in verse 21 that we should fear the Lord, submitting ourselves one to another in the fear of God. When you read that word, you need to understand that word is not written in the context of Uh, shall we say, trepidation. It's not written in the context of terror or fright, but rather it is written in the context of respect and awe and honor. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Not the terror of the Lord, but the, the, the honor and the respect and the awe of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Jesus Christ is our creator. He is our Lord. He is the king of our lives. He's the master of our discipleship. And he is awesome and and wonderful. And we should be in awe of him. Because of who and what he is, he deserves our fear. And again, we don't come to church shaking in our boots because we're afraid to be in God's presence. We come to church with honor and respect and awe. Because he's the king of kings. But yet he loves me. He's the Lord of lords, but yet he takes time from me. I am a friend of God. Paul tells us when we really reverence and fear God as we should, listen, that same spirit of reverence, that same spirit of respect will demonstrate to your brother or your sister 
You see, you can't say, I love God whom you have not seen, Jesus said, and not love your brother whom you have seen. It's just empty lip service to raise your hand and say, oh, how I love Jesus. And then gossip and slander and tear down a brother or sister sitting on the pew that come from the same father that you just said you love. Those two things cannot mutually coexist. When we reverence God, we'll also begin to show a spirit of honor and submission and reverence to our brothers and sisters. And as authentic Christians, you and I have been called to serve by the Lord each other. As well as the, the world. What did Jesus do? He knelt down and washed his disciples' feet. Amen. We've been called to serve one another. We've also been called to serve the world. Let's go to Matthew 25, 40. Let me read to you uh, something interesting here. The king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as ye have done it unto the least of these, my brethren, ye have done it unto me. You and I wouldn't think twice if the Lord needed a coat, give him a new coat. We wouldn't think twice if Jesus needed a pair of shoes, go in our closet and get one of our pairs of shoes and say, you can have my shoes. We wouldn't think twice about loading up a sack of groceries and taking it to Jesus' house if he was needing some groceries. Amen. Amen. But Jesus says, when you've done it to the least of these, and he's talking about unsaved people, he says, you've done it unto me. That requires submission. I'm not going over there in that part of town take that bag of food over to those people. No. Jesus said, "Look like, act like you're doing it to me. And if you would do it to me with the angels' band playing pomp and circumstance as you walk up to the throne room, then you can go over to those low-income apartments and drop that off. Amen. Hello? Because we're called to serve one another. Amen. During the last days of Jesus' life, he demonstrated his submission and his willingness to be a servant. Think about in the upper room. There was no servant. I'm not talking about the upper room where they got the Holy Ghost. I'm talking about the upper room where the, where the communion service, the first upper room, so to speak. There w- would not have been a second upper room without the first upper room. Amen. Let that sink in for a moment. But in that upper room where Jesus took the basin and the towel and he did what the lowest servant would have done, but there was no servant. So Jesus took the form of a servant. And he washed his disciples' feet. Peter protested. You know the story. You hear me teach it every New Year's, leading up to New Year's Eve. Peter protested. Jesus said, I'm giving you an example of honoring and serving one another. John 13, 13. Some of you are very familiar with this passage. You've heard it preached over and over and over. Jesus said, Ye call me Master and Lord, and ye say well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. I've given you an example, Jesus said. How many want to follow his example? We're quick to say that, but Jesus said, I've given you an example that ye should do as I have done to you. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord, neither he that is sent greater than he that sent him. So to belong to Jesus, the servant Lord, is to be a servant. If we are to be Christians or Christ-like, we must have the spirit of a servant. The essence of submission is to recognize and affirm the value of other people, to honor and respect other people. We would have no problem respecting the President of the United States if he walked in here, or the Queen of England uh, when she was still alive, or the King of England now. We would have no problem respecting the Governor if he was to walk in here, or the Mayor. You say, well, I'm not Democrat, I'm not Republican. I promise you, in that moment, when the office of the land is represented, you would pay honor and respect to that. Even if you didn't believe in what they believe, you would still say, that's the President of the United States. That's the Governor of the great state of North Carolina. That's the Mayor of the town of Kernersville. I'm going to stand and show reverence. We would have no problem doing that, would we? Amen. Our problem with honoring other people arises when you and I, and I'm just going to address the elephant in the room, when we start feeling better than they are. When we start feeling more valuable than they are or more important than they are. But can I tell you, in the kingdom of God, we don't acquire our value by social status. Right. 
The kingdom of God, your value is not based upon your W-2. Your value is not based on your adjusted gross income at the bottom of your, of, your, uh, of your tax file. Your value is not based on the type of car in the parking lot or the label of your clothes or on your shoes. That's not how your value is gotten. It's not by ancestry. It's not by wealth. It's not by accomplishments or talents or abilities or even spiritual gifts that God may have given you. In the kingdom of God, you and I are valuable simply because we belong to Jesus. That's what gives us our value. I'm one of God's kids. He's my dad. You're my brother. You're my sister. And the church is the mother of us all. You see, God is calling someone tonight to recognize the importance and value of our brothers and sisters in the Lord. What did Jesus say in Mark 9, 42? Whosoever shall offend one of these little ones that believe in me, it is better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and he would cast into the sea. Jesus is speaking about children. And he says, you harm one of these kids, you're better off. That a millstone were hanged about your neck and you were drowned in the ocean. If Jesus looks at a child like that, who's not even earning income, who's not even arguably a member, a productive member of society yet, if Jesus would look at a child and say, You better be careful how you treat one of these children, because that's one of my creations. How much more should we treat each other with respect? You see, when we see each other. Through God's eyes, we can see how valuable each of us is in His sight. There are no big eyes in this church. There are no little U's in this church. We are all one body. I want to remind New Life Tabernacle, we're one body. Paul said we're fitly joined together. Each part supplying a needed function for another part. You might sit here tonight and say, well, Pastor, I, I'm just a little toe in this church. But you know, that little toe gives me balance. I'm just a pinky. Well, that pinky can reach some areas that other stuff can't. Especially if you're a nose picker. I'm just, I'm just seeing who's awake tonight. Some of y'all actually open your eyes. Praise God. Welcome. Good to have you. When we see and recognize the value and the importance of our brothers and sisters, what happens? It becomes easy to be nice to them. And to respect them and to honor them. I don't think this happens in our church, but I'm going to just tell you, if you can walk by someone in this church and not make eye talk, contact and speak, you need to ask God to forgive you. Amen. If you can walk by someone in this church and you feel superior to them and you feel like they are not as important as you are, you need to pray through Amen. because you are under a strong delusion. Nobody is more important than anybody else. You say, what about you, Pastor? Hey, if I drop dead today, I would hope this church would roll right on because all of us are rooted in truth and grounded in truth. I need you, but you need me. We need one another to survive. Come on, somebody. Amen. Yeah, I can't say to the nose, I don't need you. A hand can't say to the foot, I don't need you. The writer said, what, what good would it be if the whole body was an eyeball? How funny would that person look if they were just a big eyeball? They could see real good, but they can't smell. Can't hear, can't taste, can't walk, just an eyeball. Folks, we all can't be intellectual. We all can't be extroverts. We all can't be introverts. We need everybody's personality and everybody's idiosyncrasies and everybody's talents and skills all in the same pot. What a wonderful church family it's going to be if there's room for all of us to just be who we are. Not cookie cutter little Christians, but all of us just who we are. What a rich tapestry that is in the kingdom of God. If I can be me and you can be you and we treat one another with love and respect. Amen. Amen. It becomes easy to honor people and respect people. It becomes easy to submit to them in love by honoring and respecting 
one another, by submitting to one another, we fulfill God's plan. It allows us to accept leadership from some and provide leadership for others. You see, sometimes we're, we are leaders and, and we show others the way. But there are other times in the church where you have to sit back and let others lead. Everybody can't be a leader. Somebody's got to be a follower. So lead your department. Lead it with distinction. Lead it with grace. Lead it with class. But when it comes time for you to sit back and let someone else lead you, treat them with respect. Treat them with courtesy and dignity. Somebody say amen. Amen. The true essence of the ministry of the body is mutual or reciprocal service to one another, submitting and serving one another. This is true Christian submission that I'm talking about. I'm not talking about yielding to enslavement or tyranny, but yielding to serve one another, to be an instrument of blessing and assistance to each other. Let's go to John 15, 12. While you're turning there, as servant leaders, all of us must have the ultimate good of other people at heart, regardless of what it means to us. You might have to defer and let someone else sing that solo. You might have to defer and let someone else be on the praise team at the big service. You might have to defer and let someone else take that leadership position and you follow in and and say, I'm going to support you and you're going to do a great job. Because that's part of submitting one to another. John 15, 12. This is my commandment, Jesus said, that ye sing really good. Oh, that's not what it says. This is my commandment, that you learn to hold a mic and stand in the pulpit. Oh, oh, what, what? That's not what it says. This is my commandment, that you dress real GQ. No, that's not what it says. What does it say? Plain and simple. Love one another. But there's a qualifier. As I have loved you. How many knows he loves us? Unconditionally. Greater love, Jesus said, hath no man than this, that a man would lay down his life for his friends. You see, the Lord ministers through all submitted people. Maybe you don't have a pulpit ministry. Okay, maybe you don't have a ministry where you're opening the Bible and preaching the word, but you can still minister to people. Women, men, young, old, rich, poor, trained, untrained, laity, clergy, all submitted people can have a ministry to other people. We are a unique fellowship. We're a body in which the Lord has access to all of us as we seek his will and work together from the greatest to the least. And who among us is the one that says these are the greatest and these are the least? That's up to him. But in his eyes, from the greatest to the least, everybody in the body can add something to your experience and development in God. All of you are important. The next time it's church time and the devil is in your ear trying to convince you to lay out a church, you need to please hear your pastor pleading with you. I need you here. I need you here. And I know you love me and I love you. But I'm going to take it a step further. Your brothers and sisters need you here. Because you are a part of them. And if you're not here, they don't get the benefit of iron sharpening iron in that service. And I'm going to take it a step further. Stay with me. This world needs you here. You say, Pastor, I'm just a, uh, let, me, let me just use an example uh, here, and I'm not trying to embarrass anybody. Sister Mary might say, I'm a senior citizen. I'm, I'm a widow. I'm, uh, what? Nobody needs me. There might be in a service a senior citizen lady come in who's a widow, who's looking around in that church and looking, who can I connect with in that church? And, when she, and Sister Mary's very faithful. And when they look over and see her, they're going to be like, you know what? I think I can find a home in this church. There's somebody like me in this church. You say, well, where are they? Maybe they're not here, but that might be the service that they walk in. We need our Hispanic people here. We need our African-American people here. We need our married people, white people, uh, whatever color you are, whatever language you speak. You don't know who's going to be in that service. Single parents. 
devil will talk trash to you. You're worthless. Nobody loves you. Nobody. There might be a single parent walk in that's looking around. Is there a group here I can connect with? Those little kids that are running around the church. I love that. We don't want them to tear up the church, but I love having kids here. <laughs> Amen. So parents, keep your kids. Okay? It's okay to run around and play, but don't let them start tearing up stuff. and Racing cars on the walls and getting smudge marks everywhere and licking the front glass of the pulpit before I start the service. <laughs> Teach your children to respect the house of God. Amen. Sister Sheila shouldn't have to come clean it right before I preach. Amen? Amen. Keep it clean. Teach them. That's the pulpit. You've got to train your children. And I'm not going to get off on that rabbit trail. What I'm trying to tell you is I think there's a place for having children in the church. I love these small children. Thank God we have a future here. But you know what? There might be a family walk in with a bunch of little kids, and they look around and see your kids and say, hey, I think we can raise our family here. There's, a, there's some children here. Come on. We need you. We need everybody in this church. Say, well, I'm not none of that. I'm just fat. Hey, we need some fat people in this church. Woo! We need some skinny people. We need some tall people and short people and blonde, blonde people and dark hair people. We need some, we need some bald head people. I don't care who you are. This is your church. And somebody here needs you. And can I tell you, most of all, Jesus needs you here because you are his bride. Oh, hallelujah. I'm almost done. Let's talk about authentic authority. Let's, let's get real here tonight. Most of us resist authentic authority. Let's talk about it. Growing up, either we had too little or too much of the right kind of authority. The attitude of resisting authority hinders a lot of people from growing up in the Christian life. We resist the authority and the Lordship of Jesus Christ. I'm amazed at the same people that go to their doctor, and, and I've had this conversation with my doctor, and the doctor look at your, your eyeballs and say, you're obese. And after the shock of that, you say, all right, Doc, what do I need to do? Well, diet and exercise, because you're going to die. You walk out of there, and, and, and you pay the copay. Am I right? And you stop by the little nurse that's sitting behind the desk, and you say, I need to set an appointment to come back. For the doctor to tell you again. Come on, am I, am I being honest? You'll take your car to the shop and the mechanic will say, your transmission's on its last leg, man. How much going to be? $3,000. You might get a couple more months, you might not, but it's about to blow. And you pay the mechanic to tell you bad news. But you come to church, and if the preacher has the audacity to call it like it is or preach the word, you bow up in your spirit and say, I'll go find somewhere else. Honey, you're a hypocrite. If you'll let your doctor talk straight to you and your lawyer and your mechanic, but not the preacher, you got a problem. Because I'm trying to get you to heaven. I'm not, I'm not worried about your weight. I don't care about your transmission. I want you to be saved. Which one is more important to you? Amen. We, we, we give Jesus a part of our lives. And we say, thank you for saving me, God. But when it comes down to the nitty gritty and the actual authority in our lives, we refuse that control. And then we wonder why we have no power. We wonder why we have no peace. Ain't no man going to tell me i got to come to church. We wonder why we have no authority over sin. Ain't no man going to tell me i got to pray. We wonder why we don't live in victory. Ain't no man going to tell me i got to pay my tithes. We wonder why we have holes in our bags, spiritually speaking. And we can't even pay the bills. Because you're not submitted to authority. 
Say, Pastor, you're just trying to, trying to build yourself up. Listen, I practice what I preach. I'm accountable. I answer to people. I have pastors in my life. I have presbyters in my life, superintendents, bishops. I just saw my bishop Friday night, my uh, presbyter, Brother Hutton, Friday night. Amen. I answer to these men. If I was preaching you something and wasn't doing it, I would be held accountable. Bottom line is, everybody here has to submit to someone. Let me close. There's a direct relationship between receiving God's power and submitting to God's authority and control. I believe that God has helped me, and I'm not saying this for any other reason than just to prove an anecdotal point. I believe God has helped me in ministry to get to certain levels in ministry and planting a church and, and other churches because I submitted to my pastor, Amen. Bishop Godair. I didn't understand some of the things he did. He was old school. He's still old school, unapologetically old school. But you know what? Those old timers had a way of knowing which way the wind was blowing. And so I submitted to that man's ministry. And he was able to mold me and fashion me. And I believe that's the only reason why I've survived the hell we've survived in Kernersville. Is because you don't come out from under Johnny Godair and, and, and be a wimp at all. Thank God for that. Here again, it goes to the scripture. The amount of anointing is directly proportioned to the level of submission. Look at the men that have gone out from this church that kept a good sweet spirit while they were here and submitted to my ministry when they were here and helped me build a church. Look at those men. They're all doing good. And look at the ones that didn't. I'm not being ugly or mean. I'm not trying to be embarrassing to anybody. I'm just saying the evidence speaks for itself. It's not about me. It's about this verse. Submit yourselves one to another in the fear of God. John 15, 4, Jesus said, Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can ye, except ye abide in me. So I'm just going to go out and do my own thing. You better stay in the vine. Until we accept his authority as Lord of all areas of our life, you're not going to get the fullness of power that he wants to give us. When we begin to submit to him in every part of our life, our life begins to bear fruit. And that results in power. You see, when it comes to authentic submission, we all must have authority figures in our lives. Individuals whom we respect. People we allow to counsel us, to exhort us. To correct us and lead us. As much as you don't like it when those blue lights come on behind your car. As much as you hate it when that officer walks up to the window and he's got that badge on. You know he represents the law of the land. And I know I was speeding. I can hire a lawyer to say it was improper equipment all day long. But I know it was nothing improper except my foot on the wrong pedal. Come on, somebody. That's a humbling thing. That's a humbling And we don't like it. But every now and then we get that reality check. You're under authority. You, you, you think you can go do what you want to do. Go out on 40 and try to go 90 miles an hour. See what happens. I need clients like you. Dumb, dumb, dumb. You keep me in business. I'm not going to tell you who it was, but it was a preacher somewhere between here and the Mississippi River. He bought a brand new, brand new sport car. Brand new. This is a good guy, too. This guy is a conformist. He won't do anything wrong. He is just rigidly good. Just a good man. I don't know what hit him in that night. I guess it was just the new car. He got out on I-40, looks around. This is straight stretch coming out of Iredell County. Some of y'all know what I'm talking about. It's just straight, straight, straight. The problem is there's these little thickets of trees on the left. Every five miles, little driveways, little gravel roads that the popo like to sit there and drink coffee. 
And this brother got up to 115 mile an hour. And the popo saw him and caught him. And, 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 and my friend told me, he said, the cop came to the door and said, what are you doing? He said, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I just, just brought a new car. Just want to see what it was doing. And the officer, state trooper said, the only reason I'm not putting you in jail is because it gave me a chance to see what my new car would do. Right. But, but, it took a meeting with the elected district attorney and a $1,000 donation to the local school system, plus the court cost, plus the attorney fees. And after about $2,000, that brother learned, I'm under authority. I still got to do it, but I'm under authority. There was a price to pay. Hello? And I am used that as a very, very small example. You don't know who this is. I would never tell you who it is. It may have been somebody that lives in this state. might not have been somebody that lives in the state. Point is, they got a ticket in this state. What I'm trying to tell you is, as much as you think you're big and bad, you don't get to do what you want to do. All of us are under authority. Try not paying your real estate taxes for a few years and see whose authority you're under. Try walking out of Walmart without paying for your, well, you got to scan them in now anyway, so. But try. You'll see who's on authority you are. Because that little old lady standing there that's checking the receipts, she's not the one behind the glass up 30 feet in the loss prevention room that's going to come chase you down. Amen. None of us get to do what we want to do. Let me close. Hebrews 13, 17. Obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves because they want to make you miserable. That's not what it says. Oh, my, that's what people think. That's not what it says, Brother Brian. That's not what it says, is it, Brother Daniel? Let's read it again. Obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves because they just like to aggravate you. What? Obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves because that's what preachers do. No. Look, folks, Paul said, for they watch for your souls. Here's a reality check. Some preachers in your life, some pastors in your life, really just want to get you to heaven. Amen. There is no alternative under God. We're commanded to be submissive to the authority under which we have been placed. Let's stand together. But in addition to leadership authority, you also have the people beside you. Brothers and sisters who we respect and who we are submitted and yielded to. Friend, you got to find a circle of people that you can call your own. you got to have a church family. I'm sorry, you're not going to be saved without a church family. If you're watching me online, I appreciate you joining us online. And I, I want you to know, it. I'm honored you would, you would share in our ministry. But you need a church family. And I don't mean a virtual church family. I mean a real church family. When this service is over, we're probably going to get in the car and run up to Brenner's Children's Hospital and visit with uh, Aiden and pray with him. That's, that's what a church family does. If you're not in a church family, you don't get that. Amen. When your kid's sick, you don't need a virtual congregation stretching their hands towards you and praying. You need somebody to walk in that room with a bottle of anointing oil and say, by the power and the authority of the Word of God, I speak healing right now. That's what you need. You better have you a tribe. Being submissive to our brothers and sisters does not mean we're inferior. No, we're all valuable, spirit-filled people. Being submissive to our brothers and sisters does not mean we're lesser in gifts. No, all of our gifts are important. Being submissive means that we're fulfilling our role. We're just one part, but not an insignificant part of the body of Christ. John 13, 35, put it on the screen. I want you to leave with this verse ringing in your ears. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples. If ye have love. If ye have love. love. One toward another. Somebody might aggravate the snot out of you. But as my wife's bishop used to say, you got to love them enough to get to heaven. 
You may not ever be best friends with certain people in this church simply because they're so loud and boisterous and you're so quiet and introverted. Both of you really probably have personality disorders, but you just, you just can't, you can't coexist. You may not ever be able to strike up a really good friendship with that person, but you have to love them. You have to tolerate them and you have to realize that we all have the same daddy. And we all have the same mother. Clap your hands to the Lord if you receive this word tonight. Praise God. Lord, I submit to you. Let's pray together. I submit to you, God. I submit to your leadership. I submit to my brothers and sisters in Christ. Oh, God, I submit to those that you have placed in my life as authorities. I thank you for the privilege to be connected to the body. And, Lord, I need every person in this building. I need the friendship and the love of my church family. And they need that from me. We need one another. There are no big I's and little U's, God. There are no VIPs in this church. We're all your children. We're all very important people in the family of God. Doesn't matter the skin color. Doesn't matter the socioeconomic status. Doesn't matter who's a big tither, who's not a big tither. We all need one another. We all need the body of Christ. Hallelujah, hallelujah. I ask you to let us leave here tonight, God, with a renewed sense of purpose, with a renewed sense of belonging in our lives. I'm not just a member of a church, God. I'm a member of a family. I'm a member of a body. Whether someone is brand new in this church or someone's been here in our first building back on Bodenhamer Street, God, every single one of them are important in your eyes. Every single one of them are valuable. Every single one of them are precious.